First of all, I apologize. My wife loves me so much. She shared her cold with me. I am uh, sniffling a little bit, and my voice obviously isn't as strong as it normally is, but it should be fine. Tonight we do John chapter 17 and a little bit 18. This is the high priestly prayer, as it's known. Father, thank you as we open your word this this evening that uh, you prepared this chapter for us, chapter 17. Thank you, Father, for the uh, the moment that Jesus took when he opened in prayer to you in the upper room and that he did it publicly, Father, so that we would understand what he did and we could learn from it. Thank you for this wonderful model for the way in which it will change our own prayer life after we study it. Thank you, Father, for uh, just the mere fact that uh, right now our Lord is seated interceding and that that makes our prayer powerful, Father, in a way that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And, Lord, uh, let us take what we learn tonight in this new way and these things that we may not have seen before and let us apply them. To know them is one thing, Father, but to do them is a whole other thing. And we ask you, Lord, that you would make sure that we follow through on what we learn through conviction and through the guidance of the Spirit. For we want to be doers, Father, so that we may please you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. With this chapter, chapter 17, we come to the end of Jesus' time in the upper room at the Passover meal. He's already delivered his final instructions to the disciples. He's spoken plainly to them about his plans to depart and return to the Father. He's explained a little about what their future holds, particularly after he's gone. And he has empowered them through the Spirit to operate in special ways after that time. All these things he's done, yet very little of it have they actually understood, at least yet. There's only one thing remaining to be done before they leave the upper room and begin what will be a really quick series of activities leading to his death. Jesus is returning to the Father where he's going to take up his role at the right hand as the intercessor for the church. And so the one thing left to do is to intercede, to actually begin that work of intercession even now before he departs and to do it in a very public way, which raises the thought that perhaps Jesus begins to intercede in this moment for effect. He's showing the disciples something here, even as he does the work of intercession. He wants to show them something about the nature and the way prayer is supposed to be formed in this new period, this new age in which he is interceding. And that would imply then that he's teaching them, he's modeling something for them, and in the way he speaks to the Father, we're to learn something about how we speak to the Father as well. Therefore, as we consider what he says, we're going to spend at least as much time looking at how he says it, or what he says, the manner in which he prays. Because if he intended this prayer to be a model, which I would argue he did by virtue of making it public, then it stands to reason we would do well to consider the model and adjust our own prayer life accordingly. So his prayer comprises the entire 17th chapter of John's Gospel. This prayer can be divided into three parts. You'll find it helpful in your own study, if you are one to take notes, to record these parts as we go through it, because each of the three parts has subparts. And the structure is very interesting. It helps make sense of what Jesus is saying. The first part of the prayer focuses on Jesus' mission on earth. The second part will focus on the 11 men specifically seated in this room, the men that will become the apostles of the early church. And the third part focuses on the church overall, to include you and I. Let's look at the first section. And in this first part, there are two general requests in the first part. The first request is verses 1 through 4. So if you have a Bible, it's going to be easiest probably to just, in the margins, draw uh, little boxes or little brackets around the various verses that make up the various divisions, and then you can just label them perhaps in the margin. So let's look at that first section and the first request, verses 1 through 4. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. The first thing we ought to notice as we try to understand what he's saying and how he's saying it is something you could have also seen when you look at the other major model for prayer in the Bible, which is Matthew 6 and the prayer we call the Our Father. And that is that Jesus addresses his prayer to the Father. Now, you might say, well, that's obvious. Who else is he going to talk to? He's down on earth. 
But this is consistent in everything Jesus does in prayer. He always prays to the Father. And when he told the disciples how to pray in Matthew 6, how does the Our Father begin? Our Father. So when we pray, we always and only pray to the Father. He is the one who is receiving your prayer. You may remember in the previous chapter, chapter 16, Jesus, when he was giving the disciples the instructions concerning who to speak to, he says this in John 16, 26 and 27. He says, for in that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will request of the father on your behalf for the father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the father. So Jesus says our prayers go directly to the father. He hears us because of our love for Christ. And it is not even necessary for Christ to relay our instructions to the Father in order for them to be heard. That extra step isn't required. It goes directly to the Father. Our Father is the one we pray to. And I know so many Christians, I've heard this many times, Christians who say, Jesus, would you do this for me? I, I'm not suggesting that the Father ignores those prayers or somehow they're disqualified at the gates of, of heaven. Our Father knows what we are to pray even before we open our mouth. That's not a problem, but what it does show is an immaturity in our understanding of what happens in prayer. Where is it going? How has it become effective? Who's listening, etc.? This is our opportunity to get that straight. We are to talk to the Father, and He listens to us because of Christ. And we pray in His name in that sense. But it is always to the Father that our prayers are sent. And next point, Jesus says, The hour has come. Jesus' agony and death was only hours away. So when he says the hour, we know he's referring to this period of time of his passion, which is upon him. And in that context, Jesus asked the Father to glorify him, which, again, in this context would mean to bring Jesus through the crucifixion and into his resurrected form. So we see in verse 2 Jesus alluding to his resurrection when he says, even as you gave me authority over all flesh... What he's referring to there is his authority as judge. Jesus is the judge over the living and the dead, all flesh. But he obtains that right to judge because of the mission he accomplishes on earth. All that he has been given, he's been given by the Father because he has earned it, in other words, on the cross. So all that the Father has given to Jesus, Jesus says, I may grant them eternal life. And notice Jesus reminds us he's on a mission to save those whom the Father has given him. And eternal life is defined as knowing the Father and the Son. So Jesus says, I want to be glorified, Father, so that I will have that right to judge, so that I will finish the mission you've given me, which is to assign eternal life to those you've elected. Finally, he explains that since Jesus has accomplished all the work that the Father has asked of him, the Father will be glorified on earth through the Son. This is a model for how we are to approach the Father in prayer. Throughout the prayer, what Jesus does is he offers the Father rationale for affirmatively answering his prayer. He's giving the Father reasons to do what he's asking be done. That makes sense because we know prayer is principally a means of aligning our hearts with God so that when we are in his will, we'll be asking for the very things that he desires to do in any case. And so then our prayers are likely to be answered affirmatively, right? So if you approach prayer with an expectation that you are supposed to explain your reasoning to God with each request, then you have to work out your requests. You're required under that kind of a model to think through why you're asking and to what benefit there is in the request. That's a healthy exercise because you're going to find your requests changing, at least in subtle ways, as you think more deeply about what you truly wish God to do and why he should do it. We might say something like, I want uh, my body to be healed in some specific respect. That begs the question, why? I mean, you're going to die sooner or later. Why does God need to heal you? The answer could be, well, God, I, if I have this healing, I'll be better able to attend this function and learn something about your word. Or I'll be better able to travel and do this teaching. Or I'll just be able to get up on Sunday and go to church. Now you've given him, perhaps, godly reasons behind your request. But if you can't come to that and you're not sincere about it, remember, he knows your heart. But if you're sincere in it, you may be finding yourself aligning behind God's will in a way that lets him show himself powerfully through the result. But if you can't come to that understanding, if you can't bring your request to a point where the rationale makes sense to you, do you think it makes sense to God? Lord, give me this fancy car. 
How does that glorify the Lord? How does that fall into his will? Pretty soon you're done with that request. You've moved on to something different because you can't find the rationale for it. This is the power of thinking it out and and doing it with sincerity, with an eye toward how would God presume to respond to this when you know his goal is to glorify himself and godliness in us. Finding the hook that explains why this is consistent with those goals is the only way you're going to move your heart to where prayer is speaking in God's terms. Otherwise, it's just a list like the lottery and you're hoping the numbers hit. In this case, the son's logic is perfect, as you would expect his logic to be, right? He argues in this particular case of the first request, he argues for the father to resurrect the son. That's what he's asking for. The request specifically is glorify me through this process. Don't leave me in the grave. And what's his reasoning? Well, first, because doing so would ensure the father's glory would be made complete on earth. Furthermore, then, the son's resurrection will ensure that he can deliver the eternal life to God's elect as the father desires, because if he's not resurrected, no one else will be either. Finally, in verse four, Jesus says he has done everything that the father asked him to do, and therefore Jesus is deserving of the father's response. So he makes three separate arguments that are interrelated. But he says, I can't fulfill the mission unless you resurrect me and your glory can't be made complete among the nations unless we do this. And oh, by the way, I did everything you asked me to do. I'm fully obedient to your word. So this is the expectation I should have all logically true and all in line with God's will. That's his first request for himself. Second request, verses five through eight. He says, now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. This is his second request. Jesus asked the Father now to glorify him again. But if you're looking closely, you'll notice... He's asking for something different than in the first case. Now, what he's asking for is to be returned to the position of glory that he had before he left heaven, before he became incarnate. There's a word in the Old Testament for that glory that Jesus held prior to his incarnation. That's the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory of God, as it appears at any point in the Old Testament, is always a manifestation of Christ, the second person of the Godhead. The Bible says that when Jesus became incarnate, he gave up the Shekinah glory. Philippians 2, 6, Paul says, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul says in verse 7 of Philippians 2, that Christ emptied himself, and that means he gave up his glory. He gave up his form. And then it says he came in the likeness of man. Now, those two things are being contrasted. There was who he was before he emptied himself, and then there was who he became when he's in the likeness of men. By virtue of it being a contrast, that means that he, by necessity, he left something behind in order to become man. What he left behind was what glorified him, what he had before, as he called it here to the Father, the glory he had before. That's why Jesus appears so ordinary in his human form. Isaiah says he had a very ordinary appearance. He was not a super glowing human. He wasn't Clark Kent. He was just your average guy in all respects because he put everything aside that would have marked him as something different. And again, in asking to have his Shekinah glory back, to be glorified again, now instead of just merely being resurrected, he's asking to be ascended. So the second request is, after you resurrect me, let me have my ascension back to the right hand in full glory again. And then he has reasons. First, Jesus says in his reasoning, he says he has manifested the name of God before men. The Greek word for manifest here, it simply means to be made visible, to be made clear. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he gave up his glorified position at the right hand of the father. By becoming man, Christ showed the world the father. He represented, he manifested the Father to the world at that point. And Hebrews tells us that most specifically in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Speaking of Jesus, the writer says, And he is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. 
He uses the term radiance of his glory. Radiance is like the rays of light that come off of a of an object, like the sun in the sky. So if the sun in the sky is the father, by analogy, Jesus is like the rays of light that come from it and reach us on earth. So it's the radiance of the father in the form of Christ. So his first argument to the father is, I gave up that glory in order to come down here and show everybody you. So that would imply I'd like my glory back now that I've done the very thing that I was down here to do for you. Also notice that this manifestation, he says, was only made to those chosen from out of the world. Not all men are appointed to see the glory of God in Christ. Only those who belong to the Father are included in this plan of revealing the Father to the world through the Son. You and I have come to know the Father through the Christ. And as we testify to that knowledge, we are giving evidence that we are one of those who belong to the Father, who were elect to know the glory of God in Christ. In this context, keeping the word means obeying the call of the gospel. You know, Paul talks about those who are obedient to the gospel. That's another way of saying who receive it and believe in it. So he says, I have made you known to those who you've chosen and who have kept your word in that respect. Furthermore, Jesus said, his disciples have come to know that everything Jesus has came from the Father. This is his second argument. Jesus' words and his works, those things he says he got from the Father, and now the disciples know that what he has came from the Father. He spoke from the Father's words. He performed miracles by the work of the Spirit. And he says, by these things, the elect have come to believe that Jesus has come from the Father. So here's his argument. If Jesus gave up his glory so as to make the Father known, then Jesus should receive that glory back once he's accomplished the plan. And he says, in so many words, I've accomplished the plan. They know you. They know your words. They know your works. I've done all of these things. I did that by becoming man. And now, he says, restore me to where I came from. Restore my glory. And, of course, we see this promise fulfilled at Jesus' ascension. In fact, if you jumped all the way out to Revelation chapter 1, you see John, the same author of this gospel, of course, writing about what he saw when Jesus appeared to him there, and he appears in his glorified form. So he has returned to the form that he asked to return to. So that's the first part of the prayer. Two requests by Christ to the Father. And it only makes sense that these would be the two he would ask for. What else could he have asked for that he didn't already have? He asked for his glory coming through the process as human, and he asked for his glory as God to be restored as well. Now we move to the second part of the prayer. This is where Jesus prays for the 11 men specifically. Now, there are going to be aspects of what he says here that can be considered common things for the believer. And he addresses that later in the, in the prayer. But for now, just keep focus. These things are being spoken specifically about the 11. And within this second section, there are three requests. The first concerns the physical preservation of these men when they go out to conduct their mission on earth, their, their ministry. All right, verses 9 through 14. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but on those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This section is directed, as I said, at the apostles, in verse 9, for the fourth time, Jesus focuses here on the elect of God. He says he is not praying on behalf of the world, that is to say, on behalf of the unbelieving world. He says, I'm asking something now, Father, on behalf of those who belong to you, and specifically concerning those in the room with him. He keeps adding this comment about praying for the elect or for the chosen, so that he is clearly in God's will. It's the same thing we've said about our own prayer life. When you're in God's will you're likely to hear your prayer responded to affirmatively. To ask for things for the world at large that you know are not in God's will is a fruitless prayer in the long run. He's asking for things that are within God's will. Do these things for those you love, in other words. These apostles clearly belong to the Father, and Jesus says, 
Father, I want you to preserve them for their mission. And then he gives reasons. The first reason is he says they belong to you. He says, you and I share everything. And therefore, these apostles of mine are also of yours. And therefore, in other words, you have a personal interest in this. You need to preserve these men for your sake. Second reason, Jesus says, I'm going to leave these men behind. I'm departing. They're staying here. And therefore, the appeal there is one of you have to help them in my absence. Thirdly, at the end of verse 11, Jesus asked the father to make these men one. That, that is to say, the father should preserve these men so that they can act as a team, reflecting the unity that exists among the Godhead. Fourthly, Jesus says to the father, you've got to care for these so that none will perish because that was the promise that he made earlier, that none of these men would perish. Eventually, all these men die, yes, but what he's speaking about here is preserving them for their mission, not letting them die prematurely. And you have to understand that's actually a very likely outcome for them. When a rabbi is considered rogue and is put to death, his disciples won't be far behind. But remarkably, none of his disciples are killed in the turmoil around Jesus' death, which is very unusual. That's the preservation that he's asking for here. Finally, Jesus asked the Father to preserve the disciples because they will be the prophets of the first century church, carrying the word of God into the world and into a hostile world. So just as the world persecuted Jesus because he spoke the word of God, so will they also do this for the apostles. And so Jesus asked the Father to preserve them so they can accomplish that mission of passing on the word. So his first request is that they would be preserved in their mission as a group without harm so that they can do what God has asked them to do. Next, Jesus prays for them to be physically and spiritually protected from Satan and from his forces in the world, verses 15 and 16. He says, I do not ask you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, Jesus does not ask the Father to remove these men from earth, for that would be a step in the wrong direction. It would stop the growth of the church, right? They have to stay behind if Jesus is going to leave. Somebody has to be here. So he doesn't ask them to be taken out of the world. What he says is protect them from the enemy while they're here because they're on the enemy's turf. And the reason that he offers for this is super simple. He says, because they're not from the evil one. They don't belong to the enemy. These 11 men have been born again by faith, and therefore they aren't of the world anymore, like Jesus isn't of the world. So if they're not of the world, then they're not citizens of Satan's kingdom. They're citizens of Messiah's kingdom. They've been adopted into the family of God. They no longer belong to the enemy. So he appeals to the Father, saying, you need to provide protection to these who are of your kingdom, who are yours, and not let the enemy have dominion over those things that are yours. They are not of the world. They don't belong to him anymore. And then lastly, Jesus asks that the men would be sanctified, that is, that they would be made increasingly godly. That's the third request, verses 17 through 19. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. So he's calling here for the Father to sanctify these men. And notice the way that Jesus asks for it to take place. By the way, to sanctify means to be made holy, that is, to reduce sin and increase godliness, which are inversely related. If you reduce sin, by nature you should be more godly. And those two things are to be moving in opposition to each other. That's sanctification. How does one sanctify a saint? How do we move the church toward holiness? Jesus gives you your answer. The word. He says, the word of God is the means of sanctification. Jesus' reasoning for why the Father should honor this request is because of the unique mission that these men have in entering the world. They are to be God's representatives so it would make sense that if you're going to represent God, you had better look a little bit like him. That you ought to have godliness as your calling card if you're there to tell people about the God you represent. So he asked the Father to sanctify these men, make them more like yourself, by your word, so that they be effective in the mission. And then he reminds the Father that he himself, Christ himself, sanctified himself for their sakes. What he means is Christ lived a perfect life, obedient, sinless. That's the definition of sanctified. Jesus lived a sanctified life. Why? Because that's the only way he could save them from sin. If he was not sinless himself, then on his death on the cross would be meaningless. So only a sinless sacrifice could do the job God gave him to do. So he says, 
for their sakes, in that sense, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. The Father has a self-interest and a responsibility to sanctify these men by his word. That is, to convict them of their sin through the word of God, to instruct them in righteousness through the word of God, to give them courage and desire to obey it by the spirit of God, so that they'll become more holy and thereby become more effective witnesses and ministers of the gospel. And he says, you should do these things because I've done them first. Jesus, in other words, has done them first. He's blazed the path. Isn't this a fascinating model? Have you ever considered organizing your prayer life like this? Here's a suggestion you might follow the next time you pray. Make out a list of the requests you intend to put before the Lord in prayer. And then write out one or two reasons why it would be righteous for God to give you what you seek in each case. By the way, the definition of what is righteous can't just be because you like it. (laughs) Then, when you find the reasons, if you find the reasons, incorporate the reasons into your prayer. Instead of just asking God repeatedly with the same words or with an extra please in front of something, ask him like you would ask your boss or your spouse. Reason it out so that the answer becomes obvious for them. And you'll find a couple of things happening. First thing is you're bound to think more carefully about your requests. You'll notice when your requests aren't easy to defend from the perspective of righteousness, and you may retreat from that idea altogether, which is in itself sanctification. You may modify some on the basis that you realize you've been asking for something that wouldn't quite square up with righteousness, which again is moving in the direction of the will of God. And in those ways, what we'll find happening is your requests will start to become more of a conversation, a more of a dialogue in the sense that you're really fellowshipping with the Lord through your prayer. It's not just throwing requests over the fence. You're also going to grow closer to the Father in the course of doing that. Your prayer life, if you do this, I think turns into a conversation which is rich and deep with purpose as opposed to one that is rote and habitual. We'll move to the final section of the prayer regarding all believers And in this final section regarding all of us, he makes two requests to the Father, verses 21 through 23. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through the word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. All right, notice Jesus defines clearly how his disciples are going to be made. He says here in verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, that is, on behalf of the apostles alone. That's also how we know, by the way, that the earlier part of the prayer was focused initially on these men. Then he says, now I do not ask now just on behalf of these men, but who else? But for all those who believe in me through their word through the word of the apostles. So how are disciples going to be made? Through the word of these apostles who themselves will speak the word of God. So the growth of the church, as Jesus has designed it, is dependent on the spread of the word or testimony of him through his representatives. All of that founded on the word of God. So anytime Jesus' disciples are engaged in bringing the word The truth of the gospel, the word of God to the world, that's a worthwhile endeavor. You're right in the heart of the mission of the church. Then he requests for this growing body that they would be one like the Son and the Father are one. Now, he's praying here specifically for an outcome based on a specific standard. I want the church to be one like we are one. How is that true? Well, first, that would mean to be united in identity, for the Father and the Son are one in identity. We are all to be made One body by a common baptism of the spirit, Paul says. So the answer of that prayer is in the way the body is all made through one spirit. Secondly, we are to be of one mind, being taught according to one and only one word of God. There are not multiple ways to understand our faith. There's not multiple stories of salvation. There's not multiple messiahs, multiple sources of truth. There's only one of any of that. Just as Jesus knew the Father's will and did it, so too all Christians know the truth of Christ in his word although to varying degrees. Finally, as Jesus did the works of the Father, so will believers be united in working to a common goal, that is, to the spread of the gospel. Within the true believers, those works are intended to bring about the shared desire of seeing the kingdom grow, which means specifically for more men and women to know the Lord and to glorify him. 
Right? That's the goal. That's the, the common thing we're all organized to achieve. So Jesus asked the Father that the church would be united in identity, in knowledge of the truth, and in works. Now, here's the question. Did Jesus get what he asked? Do you see around us a church that looks like that? Within the body of Christ, you might say, well, I see many divisions, many differences of opinion, many different agendas within the church, don't we? First of all, we have divisions called denominations. What is a denomination except a division? And by those denominations, we therefore sometimes assume different identities. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a whatever. Even to be called non-denominational now has its own subculture and therefore it's become its own identity, ironically. And certainly you can find many different interpretations of Scripture. And through these divisions, you'll also see different goals. You'll see some churches that are organized around pursuing social justice, some that want to better the individual circumstances of each Christian, others that emphasize biblical education or missions. You have parachurch organizations. So when you look at all that, what are you to conclude? Are we to say that the Father did not give Christ what he requested? He didn't give the church a common identity, a common knowledge of the truth, and a common set of goals or actions as the Father and the Son had? Well, the answer is no, that's not what you're to conclude. Because if you do, you're judging these outcomes from a human perspective. The enemy has certainly seeded division and confusion within the church, as the Lord knew he would. He told parables about that very thing. That's why Jesus asked earlier that we would be kept from the evil one. And the Father has certainly answered that prayer. We're, we're not in the enemy's dominion. We're separate. We're in the world, but we're not of it. What the enemy has managed to accomplish, though, in all these things he's done, is to disrupt the church. But it's a superficial form of disruption. He has created the appearance of division. Baptists may think they're different from Methodists and vice versa, but those divisions are actually illusions, even to those who think they exist. They certainly cause friction. I'm not saying they're good, but I'm saying they're not impediments for the work of God in the church. In reality, the spirit creates harmony within the body, despite those superficial divisions. Because for the true believer, and I'm putting aside those who might be hanging around inside the church without the spirit, who are not believers, but apart from them, for the true believers, those born again by the spirit, everything Jesus asked for is absolutely true, though you may not see it yourself because you've believed the enemy's lies in these various areas. For example, we all have one identity, just as the father and the son do. And that one identity is Christian. When I travel and when I teach and I associate with different groups of believers in various places, I'm invited to speak in many different kinds of churches. So there's not a major denomination I haven't been in their church and spoken in. Presbyterian, Methodist, various forms of Baptist, Pentecostal, pick it, I've done it. And most of the time, they regret it. <laughs> but it never ceases to amaze me how alike they really are, though they think they're all very different. At the same time, these groups view themselves as unique and they're even suspicious of one another. And yet when I'm there, what I see in these bodies of believers that I've visited are the same Bible questions everywhere I go. The same desire to serve Christ, by and large. The same heart for God's word. The same struggles with sin. It's the same scene over and over again, just a different name above the door. And yes, there are doctrinal differences and those do exist in the body. But that's just a consequence of the varying degrees of spiritual maturity that exist in the body. You're always going to have that challenge in the body. Even within a denomination, you will find individuals who vary in their understanding of Christian theology. That isn't proof of division or a substantiation for denomination. It's just an opportunity to teach. It's the reality of the fact that not everyone has reached the same level of understanding in the Bible, though perhaps we all think we have. Paul was dealing with that very problem in his own day even before denominations emerged in the church. In Colossians 2, 6 through 8, he writes this. He says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted, and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. His concern was, you've been taught, now grow up in that instruction and stop paying attention to all these people who want to divide you with all these worldly thoughts. If it's true, then it can be true anytime. That's just a reflection of the fact that people are different in their growth and understanding of the word. If we all attain to the knowledge of Christ in the word, then we'll all get there one day, whether on this side of glory or on the other side. 
But in the meantime, we're at different points along the path. And when you compare yourself to someone else, their view of something may be lesser than yours or vice versa. And that leaves you with the impression that we have different views. But it's been my experience that we all travel through those same thoughts on the way to the final point anyway. The Father's answer to Jesus' prayer is evident in the way mature Christians... Now, here's the standard we need to apply. What do you see when you gather a group of very mature Christians? I don't mean by chronological age necessarily, but by spiritual age. What do you see? You will find that they are universally of one identity, Christian. They are universally of one mind concerning the importance and the sufficiency of God's word, if not entirely in agreement on all points of theology. And they are certainly of one mind in ministering to the world in his name, a heart for the the lost, a love for his people, and a desire to be a part of the fellowship of the saints. And as maturity varies, so will the behavior, even to the point where some believers will have few, if any, noticeable works of faith, because they're so immature. Once again, though, those variations are not evidence that Jesus' prayer wasn't answered. They're just reflective of the fact that maturity varies. So notice Jesus' reasoning to the Father on why he should grant the request to make us all one. At the end of verses 21 and again at 23, Jesus says, This request will ensure the world knows that the Father sent Jesus and loved Jesus. Here's how that logic works. Jesus is saying that a unified church will impress the world in such a way that it will convince them we've truly heard from God. Because when you have a large, diverse group of people who are unified, it not only makes us more effective at representing the gospel, of working together, but it impresses the world in such a way because it's so abnormal. It's very unusual for a large, diverse group of anybody to agree universally on something, particularly something like religion, and to do it in harmony and in love as opposed to doing it under cult status. In fact, that's why a cult is often so attractive to some people. They are so unified, albeit in an unhealthy way, that they impress their prospective followers, that there must be something here. Otherwise, why would they all be of such one mind? Now, of course, the difference between us and a cult is that a cult achieves their unity through artificial means and usually very harmful ways, close control of the people, strict rules on what they can or can't do, intimidation. They're doing it artificially externally, clamping down and doing it in a way that's harmful. The church is unified internally by the Spirit making us very drawn to one another and similar in thought and action. So the body of Christ remains unified across space and across time. Not by rules, but by the Spirit and by the Word. That's one of the things I'd encourage anyone to do if they have the chances in ministry to travel at least a little bit, do a mission trip, do something. Because it's really encouraging to see that you can go to the other side of the world, to a whole different culture, to a group of people you'll never see again, perhaps, this side of the kingdom. And there's so much commonality from the moment you step into their world. The things they value, the things they care for, the the way they approach life, the way they see the world and God, because they've been brought through the word like we have, everything is in alignment. You see the prayer here being fulfilled every time you have that moment. So what does it say when we seek division? What does it say, for example, when we adopt denominational creeds? Or when we label our gatherings by names other than simply Christian? Wouldn't it suggest that we're working against Christ's desires and his prayer by virtue of creating divisions where we didn't need them and thereby diminishing the witness of the church that Jesus was asking be maintained? Obviously, we can't thwart his will in doing those things, but that doesn't mean we're in his will either. I would just encourage us all to think carefully about how much division we're sometimes willing to support in the church and whether we can do anything to help that. Finally, Jesus asked the Father to accomplish the glorification of the church. That's the last request he has for all disciples, 24 and 26 to to, uh, 26. He says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. So he requests that the believers on earth would be granted the same glorification that the Father is prepared to give to Christ following his crucifixion. Following the death of your physical body, because of this prayer, believers are going to receive a new physical body that you will enjoy for eternity. 
Paul teaches that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says that body is incorruptible, which means that in this new body we'll be just like Christ in that we will never die again and we will never sin. That's a glorified state. Paul says in Philippians 3, 20 through 21, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. Notice that? Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. So we will be with Christ in the same state he is by his power, and that's where we'll get a chance to finally witness him in his glorified state. But our glory will be different than his. He is inherently glorious, having been one with the Father from all eternity. In fact, he says he gave up his glory, and then he's returning to where he once was before, right? So he had an inherent glory that he will be restored to. Before the fall, Adam existed in the likeness of God's image. That's how he was created. People often say, well, I was made in the likeness of God. That's actually not true. You're made in the likeness of Adam. Adam was made in the likeness of God, but he lost that likeness when he sinned. But by faith, you're born again into the likeness of God. Ephesians 4.24, Paul says, And put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So the born again nature we have is the nature that he gave Adam. You can make a comparison. The way our glory relates to the glory of Christ is in the way the moon's glory relates to the glory of the sun. One has inherent glory. One has reflected glory. And that's really a way to see how we will be in the heavens. In the sense we will have glory, but it will be a lesser form, something derivative of what Christ alone has inherently. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of Christ, God are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the spirit. So Jesus asks that every believer enter into the state of glory that he will know. And then his reasons are first, that's the only way they're going to ever see me. How are they going to see my glory and appreciate my glory if you don't bring them up here where they can see me? That's simple, right? But it's profound. Unless we are like him, we can't get near him and be with him. So he's saying to them, to the Father, you have to glorify them if they're going to come up here to see me. And the whole point of me being glorified, the whole idea of the word glory, is for the magnificence of God to be seen and appreciated. So how are they going to see it if you don't show it to them? Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. The writer there says the church should pursue the sanctification of men, meaning the salvation of them. He's talking about sanctification in the ultimate sense. The sanctification that comes upon our entry into heaven, the glorification of the Lord. He says, pursue that without which none will see the Lord. It's a means of saying, be at peace with all men, go out into the world, be peaceful and bring them the gospel. Bring them the sanctification that comes to the knowledge of Christ without which no one will see the Lord. So Jesus' argument before the Father is that that God's entire plan of redemption was intended to reunite fallen man with their creator, And that can only be accomplished by glorifying men, which is obviously dependent on the gospel and Christ's death. And so he's adding this last piece to the Father saying, glorify them so that they can see the glory that I possess and enter into our presence. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, he says, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The barrier that God has to overcome. The second reason he gives for glorifying the church is his love. The Son has made known the Father's name and his love for the Son, and now by the Spirit, the Son will place the love of the Father in each disciple. So here's what he's saying. He's saying the Father's love will reside in each disciple by virtue of the Spirit being in them. Certainly then, the Father must love those who have love of God in them. In 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That's the concept. He can't turn his back on himself, and he's put his spirit in us. And so the prayer concludes, Jesus having made the arguments for what he wants in all cases, he finishes. At this point, the scene completely changes in John's gospel. We leave the upper room, having seen this prayer complete. And abruptly, we enter the last stages of Jesus' earthly life. And today, all I want to do for you today, in the time we have in chapter 18, is look at the betrayal moment of Jesus 
in chapter 18, beginning in verses 1 through 3. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden, in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus leaves the upper room. He crosses the Kidron Valley, goes up the other side, walks up the slopes of the Mount of Olives, and he gets into the Garden of Gethsemane. When you look at the other Gospels, Jesus asks eight of the eleven men to stand guard, to stand watch at the entrance of the garden, and then to remain there in prayer while he takes three of the other disciples and they go off further into the garden. Mark says this in Mark 14, 32. He says, they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you notice he asked for this prayer time to be done. But notice what he asked for in the prayer. He asked for them to pray for themselves, not for him. His concern is that they would pray not to be tempted by what's going to happen. And they can't do it. They fall asleep, which tells us they had no appreciation for the gravity of what was about to happen. But Jesus can't sleep. He's full of anxiety. He's fearful. And you can completely sympathize. I mean, he knows what's coming. And we know that this agony is unbearable. And it's so bad that he asked the father, basically, if you have another solution possible, could we pursue that one at this point, please? His request in Mark 14, 36 is proof all by itself that another solution for sin was not available. The only way to reconcile men to the Father was through the sacrificial death of Christ. And yet, in his humanity, he's desperate for an alternative. But for anyone to both acknowledge Jesus as Christ and also to think that other ways to heaven are possible, you just need to bring him here and say, if Christ himself was asking for another way to be possible to avoid his own death, and the answer from the Father was that self-evidently no, then there was no other way. For the father wouldn't have said no to his own son's request if there was a second way. As Luke reports, the pressure he felt in this moment was so great that it caused small blood vessels near the surface of his skin to break, leading to sweating of blood, which is a medical condition that's known to happen under severe stress. So John's account skips all of these details, and I only covered a bit of them because it's interesting to, to note them in passing. And John skips them because they were already available in other Gospels. For John, then, the emphasis will be on the manner of the betrayal and the events that cascade immediately afterward. And in this case, the manner is by Judas, as we know. He is the betrayer. Now you see why you needed him. Someone had to lead the authorities to Jesus' location. Someone who had to know where he would be on that night in the garden. And someone who could therefore be useful to the Jewish authorities who were seeking for Jesus. Because timing was everything for the Jews and the Romans in this regard. This is Passover week. During Passover week, this city is filled with literally millions of Jewish pilgrims. And during the day, Jesus is, is someone, somewhere that you can find him. He comes out into the open. He teaches in the temple. But there he's, fill, he's surrounded by adoring crowds. There's no way they're going to take him by force under that set of circumstances. It's a recipe for a riot. But at night, you've got two million people all dressed exactly the same, moving around in and out of the city at night. They have no idea who Jesus is. It's not like he has a, a big sign on his back. So it's easy to just disappear into the crowds at night. So at night, they don't know where he is. In the day, they can't take him. They need a betrayer, someone who will take them to him at night. And that's what Judas does. That's the very reason Jesus included him among the 12, he said. He needed one of the 12 to be willing to turn in Christ. And a true believer, a true apostle of Christ, a born-again believer, is not going to do that. You need someone whose heart is not believing. Judas is a great case study in the sovereignty of God in his conflict with the enemy. Jesus picked Judas. Jesus orchestrated the timing of Judas's departure from the upper room. And Jesus makes himself available in the very place that he knew would be the only place Judas would think to lead the authorities. 
There's nothing about this whole set of circumstances that lay within Judas's control, though I'm sure from Judas's point of view, he felt like he was doing everything under his own auspices. The truth is the opposite. God works through sin at times, and he works through the enemy when needed to accomplish his plan. And when the Lord uses Satan for his own purposes, you cannot jump to the conclusion that Satan is winning in some kind of tussle where you're keeping score. God is never not in control of Satan. Even as Satan thinks, he has the upper hand at times. And that's true here with Jesus and Judas. But friends, it's also true in any circumstance you and I face. I don't care how bad the circumstances become for anyone to include up to death for somebody in the body of Christ. As I like to say, we'll all die sooner or later anyway. That's proof of nothing. How you die, when you die, is proof of nothing when it comes to God's love or his power or any such thing. It's just the timing at his choosing. He's always in control. So as we finish, Judas approaches. He brings a cohort. A cohort could be as many as 600 Roman soldiers, probably more like two or 300 in this case. They come complete with torches and they come with weapons. Why do they do this? To arrest Jesus. Well, this show of force has nothing to do with Jesus, at least not directly with his power. Even the torches are unnecessary because we know Passover takes place on a full moon. So they would have had plenty of light. The concern is for what the disciples or followers of Jesus might have done. So this is crowd control by virtue of intimidation through a large force that shows up to avoid anyone thinking they can step in and stop what's about to happen. Notice the soldiers have been sent by officers of the priests, which refers to the Jewish authorities over the temple, and they come to arrest him appropriately enough in darkness. Remember John's motif? Darkness will reign. In fact, look what Luke records Jesus saying at this moment. Luke 22:52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this hour and power of darkness are yours. So this timing is purposeful. It reflects the darkness of the moment. For a short time, the Lord is letting Satan have a degree of reign here that he never would have had otherwise. So as we move into the trial and the passion in coming weeks, John is going to highlight certain details that are overlooked by the other Gospels. But what we're going to see when we look at all these details, there's one overriding purpose John has in what he shows throughout the, the passion, the trial and the passion of Christ. It's Christ in control. All the details he highlights are to emphasize this concept, that the enemy is being used by God and God and Christ specifically are always in control of everything that happens all the way through. In fact, the scene opens with a show of force and a formal arrest. But none of what's going to follow would have happened without Jesus' consent. He has the power to stop this process at any time, which, by the way, makes his death and suffering all the more remarkable. It reflects his obedience to the will of the Father. I mean, it's one thing to submit yourself to a process that leads to death, but when your submission is just to get it started and then you lose control after that, well, at least there's no going back, right? You can at least console yourself in knowing once I take that step, it's all, it's all just going to happen. But it's another thing altogether to have to continually submit to severe treatment and abuse, knowing that you have the ability to stop it at any point in the process. You have to keep saying yes all the way to the end. Look how John emphasizes Jesus' control. Verse 4, So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore, he again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke of those whom you have given me. I lost not one. Look at all the emphasis on his control. Right? He knew they were coming. He knew why they were there. He voluntarily approaches them. Now, we know from the other Gospels that Judas kisses him to tell them who the person is. But John wants you to understand that this kiss wasn't the reason Jesus was identified. He's identified by his own volition. My guess is he was walking toward the cohort, even as Judas was approaching him and kissed him. So Jesus was intent on being found. Otherwise, they never would have been in the garden to begin with. Right. Secondly, notice who initiates the conversation. Jesus says, who do you want? They tell him, we want Jesus. They name him. And then he plainly says, I am he. Literally translated, what he says is, it is I. And that's a natural thing for him to say, of course. But it's also a statement Jesus has used already in the Gospels to identify himself as God. 
And it would seem in this moment that it had both effects. It was the ordinary answer, but it was also a supernatural declaration because as soon as he speaks the words, this entire contingent of men fall backward onto the ground. And now there are different views that exist on, on why this is happening or what's going on in the moment. But it would seem to me a natural reading of the text is that this is not a voluntary act on the part of these men. I mean, they have no reason to do this given why they've come, right? And they get right back up, so it's not like they wanted to be on the ground. It seems that it's the supernatural power of God's word to press them back as he declares his name in front of them. As Paul says in Philippians 2.10, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So it would seem as though the name of Christ has put these men on the ground. You know, how, how comical, right? They've come with all this power to arrest him. They all fall on the ground. And then Jesus has to say, uh, you're here for what again? Please get back up. And John has given us this detail to emphasize how little power this crowd truly had in accomplishing what they've come to do. Jesus would not have been captured had he not voluntarily gone with them, and not a cohort of soldiers was enough to arrest him. In fact, Jesus has to prompt them to go forward with their mission. Then lastly, he says, you can take me, but you're not taking my disciples. Sure enough, none of them are harmed. As I said earlier, a remarkable event when you consider that normally anyone associated with a with a bad actor would have been rounded up with him. That's the power of God to ensure what goes on here. And you're going to see it through the trial with Pilate and all the way to the point of the scriptures say he willed himself to death in the moment in which he gave up his spirit. He had no sin. He was never going to die. He was going to hang there forever until he gave up his spirit. So that is the power of what Christ did all the way to the very end. It is him volitionally doing what we see happening in this moment. Thank you for putting up with my voice tonight. Let's pray and finish. Father, thank you, Lord, that you uh, sustain the strength of my voice tonight and help me finish this uh, teaching. Please give us, Father, a, a good drive home tonight safely. Give us things to consider about how we pray to you, Father, how we witness, how we remain unified in the body. And as always, let us reflect on the sacrifice that our Lord made on our behalf voluntarily in the face of such great agony. For that is the love you had for us, Father, and the love you do. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.